Good to see you here. Thanks for coming. Uh, as you know, the leaflets are out the, on the, the hallway. They're free. There's one on reflexology. There's a number of issues uh, that are relevant, good to be aware of, and you can take any of those outside. And then uh, Hannah's here tonight uh, for Paul's. Uh, ha it hasn't been well either, so um, Hannah is doing the recording and she has materials at the back. So there's one, Unless the Lord Build the House. Uh, a series that we done a while ago, and then one on Halloween and the occult. I think that was preached over in um, over in Banbridge a few years ago. So uh, that was just on what the Bible has to say about it. So there's a number of uh, CDs and DVDs. So if you'd like any, uh, you can take a look at them. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we're going to turn together to a book that we may not have looked at before. I think on any of these nights is in Zechariah. Now, if you've never heard of him or you're not familiar with him, if you go to the end of the Old Testament, Malachi, and you turn backwards, then you'll very soon hit the little book of Zechariah. It's just before Malachi. And uh, he's what we call a post-exile prophet. Uh, and we'll explain that in a moment. Tonight is going to be slightly historical, so we're going to give you a slight insight because that's very important. Uh, when you read a passage of scripture but you take it out of its context there's dangers with that because uh, you can you can put it into a different context and then it doesn't make sense and it you, it can lead to lots of problems so uh, more and more as i study the bible i realize that you have to speak within the context uh, very often to to prevent a uh, deep error so we're going to read zechariah and we're going to go from chapter one a few readings, uh, chapter 1, verse 1. Zechariah, chapter 1, verse 1. In the eighth month, in the second year of Darius, came the word of the Lord unto Zechariah, the son of uh, Berechiah, the son of Idu, the prophet, saying, The Lord hath been sore displeased with your fathers, therefore say thou unto them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Turn ye unto me, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will turn unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. Be ye not as your fathers, unto whom the former prophets have cried, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Turn ye now from your evil ways and from your evil doings. But they did not hear nor hearken unto me, saith the Lord. Your fathers were, where are they? The prophets, do they live forever? But my words and my statutes I commanded my servants, the prophets, did they not take hold of your fathers? And they returned and said, Like as the Lord of hosts thought to do unto us according to our ways, and according to our doings, so hath he dealt with us. Upon the fourth and twentieth day of the eleventh month, which is the month Sebat, in the year, second year of Darius, came the word of the Lord unto Ze uh, Zechariah the son of Berechiah and the son of Edu the prophet, saying, I saw by night, and behold, a man riding upon a red horse, and he stood among the myrtle trees that were in the bottom or in a valley, and behind him were their red horses speckled and white. Then I said, O oh my Lord, what are these? The angel, it was an angel that he saw, talked with me and said unto me, I will show thee what, what these be. And the man that stood among the myrtle trees answered and said, these are they whom the Lord hath sent to walk to and fro through the earth. And they answered the angel that stood among the myrtle trees and said, We have walked to and fro through the earth, and behold, all the earth sitteth still and is at rest. Then the angel of the Lord answered and said, O Lord of hosts, how long wilt thou not have mercy on Jerusalem and on the cities of Judah, against which thou hast had indignation these threescore and ten years? And the Lord answered the angel and talked with me, with good words and comfortable words. So the angel that communed with me said unto me, Cry thou, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I am jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion with a great jealousy, and I am very sore displeased with the heathen that are at ease, for I was but a little displeased, and they helped toward the affliction. Therefore thus saith the Lord, I am returned to Jerusalem with mercies, my house shall be built in it, saith the Lord of hosts, and a line shall be stretched forth upon Jerusalem. Then come with me over to chapter 2. And we're going to read a few verses from chapter 2. I lifted up mine eyes again and looked, and behold, a man with a measuring line in his hand. 
And then said I, Whither goest thou? And he said unto me, To measure Jerusalem, to see what is the breadth and le the length thereof. And, the, and behold, the angel that talked with me went forth, and another angel went out to meet him. And he said, Run and speak to this young man, saying, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as towns without walls for the multitude of them and cattle within. And then chapter 3, verse 1. And he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan. Even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with change of raiment. And I said, Let them set a fair mitre upon his head. So they set a fair mitre upon his head and clothed him with garments, and the angel of the Lord stood by. Amen. And we know God will bless these readings from his word. Let's unite in prayer together. Our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for your precious and infallible word. And as we come together, Lord, to open your truth and to look at it, we ask for the help of the Holy Spirit. I again, Lord, give myself completely to you. I pray that you will sanctify me and set me apart and fill me with the Holy Spirit. I pray that you will open all our hearts to your word. And Lord, that you would speak to us, that you would unstop our ears, that you would commune deeply into our spirits through the truth. And we pray tonight, Lord, and ask your blessing on all that can't be here through sickness and various reasons, that your hand be upon them, that you minister to them. And Lord, again, we come to thank you for all the plans that you have for us, plans that are good and not evil, to give us an expected end. So Lord, put a hedge again around us. Grant that your presence be the glory in the midst. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. In the Christian journey, I'm sure you're no different to me that you sometimes say, what is God doing? What is God doing? And as you get older in the faith and you follow the Lord, you feel and sense sometimes God has a plan or a purpose for your life. And you sense maybe you're going one direction and then it goes another direction. And, and sometimes you just almost in your spirit, you put your hands in the air and say, what is going on? Where am I going and where is God going? And it can be quite confusing. I want to speak with that in my mind tonight, and I want to bring that to the forefront of your thinking as we approach the book of Zechariah. But I promise you, I'm only going to speak out of a few, there's a few parts that we've read, and we're going to really highlight those because time wouldn't permit us to really cover, cover the book. But uh, the early part of the book of Zechariah, it's really not totally, but you can almost divide it into two. The first part of the book of uh, Zechariah is to do with the present. That is what he's dealing with in his life at that time. The latter part is more prophetic. It's dealing with what God has shown him that's going to happen in the future. It talks about the Messiah. For example, in the latter chapters, you remember it talks about the Lord coming on a donkey into Jerusalem uh, and the fall of an ass and they were crying, Hosanna. Well, of course, that's in Zechariah. He was told that uh, 500 years before the event occurred. And so he is a prophet. And there's so much in the latter part, but we'll not, I don't want to draw your attention to that. It's the early part that I want to draw your attention to. The wonderful thing about Zechariah is that he's maybe the most neglected prophet, and yet he's the most unique and fascinating. There are many parts of Zechariah that are difficult, to say the least, to understand. But that shouldn't put us off reading the book and laying hold of the parts that are very clearly comprehensible, that we can lay hold of and really take into our hearts. And so, really what I want to speak or put a, a title on is Behind the Scenes. We're going behind the curtains. You know, it's a bit like a, uh, whenever the, the uh, 
uh, puppets are working. You know, the guy pulls the strings and he's working. But there's a lot of stuff going behind the curtains. And if you go to the theatre, I'm told that it's like that. There, everybody's shuffling behind, but it's all going on up front. And, and that's what Zachariah is very like. It's, it's like an unveiling of behind the scenes. Now, you and I are on the stage, okay? You and I are, are in life, what we call life. But there's a behind the scenes. There's another dimension that's operating as well. And most of us never see that. Most of us rarely think about it. But Zechariah gets a complete, full-blown view of behind the scenes. And it's very interesting what God shows him. And that's what we're going to look at briefly tonight. He's a good friend, Zechariah, of Haggai. Haggai, of course, was the prophet that came in about 516 BC. He came to encourage the Jews. What had happened was, through their disobedience, the Jews had been thrown out of their land and been taken captive by the Babylonian Empire, which was north, and they had been brought in and they just had to assimilate into their lifestyle. But when they had been sent up there through Jeremiah the prophet, who was uh, at the time warning them of the judgment of the Babylonians, he had lived many years before, he had been told by the Lord that, the children of Israel, if they don't get their ways sorted out, I'm going to take them captive by Babylon, which did happen. But the Lord gave a promise. He said to Jeremiah all those years before, he said, but if they go into captivity, and they did, he said, after 70 years, I will visit them. After 70 years, they will return to Jerusalem and they will rebuild the temple. That was a very clear promise that God had given. And so that 70 years had almost, almost come to fruition. And so the opportunity was given to the, by the Persians, they had taken over the old empire, and so they gave them opportunity and said, listen, you Jews, if you want, you can return to your country. And not many went for it, because most people were happy in Babylon. That you know, they liked the big gardens and the walls, the food and everything. But he said, you can go back to your culture. You can go back and worship your God. So, you know, there was a, a small stream went back. And in that stream that went back, there was a man called Joshua. He was the high priest. And then there was Zerubbabel. He was going to be the kind of the replacement of the kings. So these two important men went back. And they all returned back. And in Haggai's day, you know, I'm sure most of you know the story, but uh, they have come back and it's because God has promised and uh, he wants them to rebuild the temple. But when they get back, they're devastated. This is a completely barren land. There's nothing there. The temple is in ruins. Uh, there's, there's really no vegetation. There's nobody wants them. Uh, it's just not pleasant. And they kind of had maybe big ideas as to what God was going to do for them and it didn't look good. So they got so discouraged. And others discouraged them to the extent that they just decided, listen, let's forget about this old temple. Just build our houses. So they start into their private affairs and they build beautiful houses. Haggai sent by the Lord. And he said, you're building your houses, but my house lies waste. He said, you're planting and you're trying to make good crops, but nothing comes of it. You put money in your pocket. It falls out through the bottom. He said, nothing's working out for you. And he said, I want you to consider your ways because he said, you have not built the temple. You have not put me first. And that's the theme of, Haz of Haggai. Consider your ways. You have not put me first. You have been more concerned about your own finances, about your own home, about your own family, and my house lies waste. That's the theme. In around the time, Haggai only preached for three months. That was the length of his ministry. Three months. But when his ministry is coming to an end, 
Zechariah comes along. He's also a prophet. And he comes along and he, he notices that after, as Haggai has been preaching to them, you know, they still need a, a bit more encouragement because it's difficult. Now you say to me, well, Alan, you've given us a background, but what, how is that relevant to us? That old story from, you know, thousands of years ago. Very relevant. The real crux of what we're looking at tonight for every true Christian today is that, is that what we're about to look at regarding beyond the veil, which we're going to open up now and see, is that it all rests on the promises of God. You see, the reason why these people returned to their land was because God had promised them that after 70 years, he would bring them back to Jerusalem. Going back to the Abrahamic uh, uh, promise, God had always promised that there would be a Jewish nation. He always promised that they would succeed and that they would bless the earth. The promises of God are, are uh, covenants that are retained and kept. They were non-negotiable. There were promises that were made and God said, they stand. And so with that promise, these people felt motivated. And in our Christian walk, God can give us promises. First of all, the promises of his word. As we just read his word, there are promises. The Bible calls them exceeding great and precious promises. When I was a young Christian, the late Reverend Sam Workman, I remember he preached and he said, don't put your promises, uh, 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 talked about putting them in pictures, and he said, don't frame them, claim them. I didn't quite understand what he meant. I was only a young Christian. But he said, don't frame them, claim them. Well, I think he should both frame them and claim them. But the claiming's the important. Don't just have them on the wall. You've got to claim them. And as a Christian, you've got to learn to plead the promises of God. And the more you use the promises of God, the greater possibility and probability that you will come into alignment with what's happening beyond the veil. Now, I want you to hear that again. The more that you plead the promises of God through his word or that are given to you personally in your Christian life, the more you plead them, they will bring you into alignment with what's happening beyond the veil. You see, promises are central. Has God given you promises? You say, Alan, I have had people come up and said this, that, and the other, and they've prophesied this and prophesied that. And sometimes people, what can happen is they get things that they're given, and that's not of God. And it just leads them on a wild goose chase and disappointment. Whenever God speaks to you uh, in your heart, whether through the Word of God, or just by the Holy Spirit into your spirit, or by a word of prophecy from another believer, whatever means God may use, or a dream, whatever means God may use to communicate, one of the ways you will know that it's from God is that it will be lodged in you. It will become part of you. It is not something that you have to always lay hold of, but it is something that lays hold of you. It's something you can't shake off. It's something that's down deep in the depth of your being that you know deep down where nobody else can see, you know that God has spoken that to you and you can't shake that off. That's when you know that God has spoken to you and really know it. And so what happens is these prophets come along and especially Zechariah. And I want you just in passing to notice, we're not going to read it again, but in chapter one, by way of introduction, he says to them, you need to listen to the Lord. He said, I want you to stop and consider that your fathers and the prophets, both good and bad, they're all gone. But I want you to think back over the generations before you. You know, there's a lot of people today should say you shouldn't think about what's before you or what generations were before you. But the Bible has a lot to say about the generations before you. 
And the Lord said through the prophet, he said, I want you to think about how they have behaved and what they've done. And he said, they disobeyed, they did their own thing, they didn't listen to what I had to say, and God said, what was the consequences? Well, it was, it was going into captivity. And he said, every generation did it. They all did it. And so this prophet Zechariah is saying to them, listen, here's God's word to you. If you won't listen to me simply because I'm saying it, at least listen to me because you can look back over your ancestral line and see that there was no blessing on them at all. In fact, quite the contrary. They lost everything because of their rebellion against the prophets. They didn't listen to God. Sometimes today people talk about, you know, how our fathers were and how it used to be. And friends, thank God there is a heritage of God-fearing people. There is a heritage of gospel preaching in our land. And there are good things. But listen, there were many bad things. There were many bad things we have inherited as the people of God. There were many things that we should have been aware of as Christians and our fathers should have been aware of that, that had they been more obedient to God, perhaps even our land wouldn't be in the state that it's in today. It, it, for example, in the past, our, our fathers, now we can understand this, and I understand it's sensitive ground, but I have to say it, in, in the past, in this land of Ireland, there was great fear a hundred years ago among Christians and Protestant people. And they were full of fear, and the Christians were full of fear. And as a result of their awful fear of going into an all-Ireland, what happened was they finished up uh, having the partition, and that happened. And then, of course, you know the awful bloodshed that went on and whatever. Now, I don't know if that all could have been averted or would have been, but one thing I would say, that there are many Christians, and... and I don't think they are in alignment, and I would have to say in my own life that I'm finding that God is having to bring my mind and heart into alignment, because I could be saying that I'm right in what I believe or what I say or what my fathers did, but if I look beyond the veil, I might find that my fathers were very out of line with God. And in fact, God wanted to do wonderful things because it was the Protestant people largely who carried the gospel. It was they who had this wonderful truth. And yet rather than spreading it in fear, they divided. Now I could get into trouble for saying that and I'm not I'm talking about borders, you understand. I'm talking about principles where, where very often our fathers didn't do the right thing. Did they do the right thing then? I'm not saying they did or didn't. All I'm saying is that we need to be in alignment and recognize not everything that our fathers did was according to the will of God. You see, friends, the veil is lifted. The veil is lifted in this chapter 1 that we have read together. And in chapter 1 and the verse Eight. It says, I saw by night, and behold, a man riding. Different translations uh, do it a different way, but this is the way the general trend of the chapter 8, and this is where the veil lifts for Zechariah. Now let me again fill you in for Zechariah for his sake, because he has come with Haggai, and he can see the, 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 the temple being built. He can see the discouragements. The people are disinterested to some extent. There are opponents that don't want it built. Uh, there hasn't been a lot of blessing financially. I mean, it's not the most wonderful place to be. And Zechariah is stuck with a small, relatively small group of Jews, with the majority of them in Babylon enjoying the life. And the man is discouraged. And he's trying to push the people forward with God. And it's not easy. It's not easy. And so into that mindset, God steps in. And when he's in bed, he's going to sleep. 
The Lord gives him a wee shake and says, Zachariah, Zachariah, waken up. Waken up. I've got a vision for you. Not a dream because you have to sleep to get a dream. You have to waken up. And so on his bed, with all this going on outside and all these discouragements, God just suddenly lifts the veil. And he just literally blows this man away. And what happens is, in the first of eight visions, he gets eight of them. The first one he gets is relating to angels, primarily angels. Some others, but this is the primary one. And suddenly he's introduced to these angelic beings. No record of him having met any of them before, knew anything, but here they appear. And he knows very clearly what they are. And, and whenever he talks to them, uh, what happens is, they, there's one in particular who's standing, and there's many others in the valley, and he looks and he can see this one that's beside him, and then all these other ones on horses. And he's looking, and the horseman says, you know, I'm, I'm sent by the Lord, and then he says, well, what he, what he is doing? What, what, what's all this about? What, what's happening? And the angel listens to the other angels, and they say, we have, we have been traveling over the whole earth. Now, some commentators say, I don't know if they're right or wrong, they say horses, because horses were renowned at that time as the fastest mode of transport. For example, if you were reading it today, you would maybe say they were on rockets. Do you understand? They might have literally been go traveling on horses, but the point is it was the fastest mode of transport. It may have alluded to the fact that they traveled with great speed. That's undoubtedly true of angels, but there were a number of them, and they said, we have gone round the whole earth, and we have come back to tell you that the earth is at peace. There's no wars. There's no country at conflict. We have been round, we've seen it all, and we're back to tell you. And as this is happening, Zechariah is watching it. What's that to do with? Well, there are a few things that Zechariah learns that would be good for you and I to learn. First of all, that angels are watching and reporting back to higher angelic beings and then back to the throne of God of what is happening on earth. Angels are watching Syria. They're watching Ireland. They're watching Brexit. They're watching Europe. They're watching Africa. They're watching Russia. The Bible teaches it. They're traveling and they're, they're reporting back to other angels to what's happening on the earth. Now that would have been enough of a vision for me. But that's just the first little part. Not only do angels watch and report, we find that same concept. You remember when the angels came in, in Sodom and Gomorrah and the sin was ascending. There was, a, there was this terrible kind of a, a wretched uh, stink or stench rising up from Sodom and Gomorrah and it was going up toward heaven. And that's what sin does. It's like an ascending smell goes up before the throne of God. And there's always a point where God says no more. Always has been, always will be. Don't be thinking this world because it's celebrating LGBT and all that, that that's going to go on. That's not going to go on. I don't know how long it will go on, but it won't go on forever because there comes a point when God sent the angels and they said, God has sent us to come and see. We're here to report on what's happening here. And so angels report back, back to, to senior angels and then back to God. But not only that, what's interesting is they do not have full insight into all that's happening. Because although this message came back that, that, the, that the earth was at peace, one of these angels began to talk, the senior angel began to talk to God. And this is what he said, and I'm paraphrasing it. He says, God, what about the 70 years? What about the 70 years that Jeremiah talked about God? This is angels. Lord, there was 70 years and you said then Jerusalem would come back and there's peace over all the earth and there's no sign of the... There's no sign of anything happening. You know, they question. 
They question the promises of God. They bring things to God just the way you and I do. Angels do that. And they don't have sin. And so the angel brought it to God and he said, God, God, you know, what about the 70 years? And I love this. In chapter 1 and verse 13, it says, And the Lord answered the angel and talked with me with good words and comfortable words. Now, the way that's in the authorized, it seems as though the Lord is coming to comfort uh, Zechariah. But he's not. He's coming to comfort the angel. You see, the angel's a wee bit disturbed about this 70 years and no sign of, 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 the, of this being built, this, this, this uh, Jerusalem being restored. And the Lord comes and he comforts the angel. I don't know how he did that. But it says he spoke kind words and he comforted him. He just assured the angel, it's okay. I have it in hand. I have it in hand. Don't worry. Don't be anxious about it. I'm looking after it. Angels. He sees the angels. But not only does he see those things regarding them, but, but look at what it says immediately after the Lord uh, comforts him. In verse 14 of chapter 1. So the angel that communed with me said unto me, Cry thou. Okay? Cry thou. He's got insight from the other side. The angel knows now that God has spoken to him and God has given him insight about the rebuilding of this temple on the earth. And so what, what's needing to happen is the people who are discouraged, who Haggai and Zechariah are working with, they need a bit of a, a G up. They need a bit of a lift to get the thing going. And so... God requires men. God requires people like you and like me. He doesn't delegate it to the angel to go and do something, but the angel in the vision says to Zechariah, you cry. And this is what you have to cry. You have to essentially cry that this place is going to be built and this is the will of God. That's what you have to cry. But you have to do it. You know, we have a responsibility to line up with God's purposes and to do and cry and say what God needs said. It's very important because it's all about alignment with what God is doing. It's not merely following the tradition of our fathers. It's not merely having what we call an old time gospel mission. We need a new time gospel mission because the problem with old time gospel missions is that that was a different alignment things were different in the heavens at that era but this is a different era and we can't trail the old era to the present we have to live with the present and so we've got to hear from that present uh, beyond the veil to get what we have to do now now there's another thing I want you to notice and it really fascinated me and that is in chapter 1 and verse 1 to 6 and verse 3 and 4 it says that, uh, let me read just one of the verses. In, in the latter part of chapter 3, I will turn unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. The Lord of hosts. Some of you, it'll be the Lord Almighty. That's an interesting term that Zechariah is using to declare the building of the temple. To do what God wants to be done on earth. What this generation are to do. What God wants them to do for his kingdom. And come into alignment with him. He says God is the God Almighty. He is the Lord of hosts. What does that mean? Zechariah is saying, inspired by the Holy Spirit. He's saying he is the Lord of battle. He is the Lord of the army. He is the Lord of war. And look at chapter 2 because it, inf it, it, it really pushes, pushes it through. Chapter 2 and verse 13. Be silent, O all flesh, before the Lord, for he is raised up out of his holy habitation. The picture is in Zechariah's day that while the people are sleeping... 
And while Zechariah needs to get this vision from the angels that God has risen up, that God has risen while the earth is at peace and he has bestirred himself from a place of rest because he's getting up to fight. He's getting up to do something. He's getting up to intervene on the earth. That's a wonderful picture. The Lord getting up, stirring himself from his habitation. My dear friends, when the promises of God are given, you can be assured that there's going to come a stirring up. When promises are pleaded until they're fulfilled, God stirs himself up. If we could see through the veil in the Isle of Lewis, or the Welsh Revival, or the Ulster Revival, or International Revivals, we would find in those places where the people of God had pleaded the promises of God back to him, that there came a point when God raised his army. The army of angels. He's the Lord of the hosts. And he bestirs himself to come and to fight. Fight who? To fight the enemy of the people of God. To fight the demonic hordes that keep the people of God subdued and beaten and defeated. And so the Lord is stirring up. Now in the second picture, and I'm only going to say it in passing because of our time. The Bible says, you can read it in your leisure, these wonderful uh, passages, but the second picture he gets is, is that of a carpenter or some, it's a blacksmith. And he's coming to, the, he sees these four horns. And these are the great powers, the superpowers of the world who had so crushed Israel and so taken her into captivity. And these great powers are at rest now. And the Bible says that the angel then revealed, he said, this is gonna, there's going to be a stirring. There's going to be an international shift. Well, most of us who hear uh, our brother um, Alistair Petrie, well, Alistair talks a lot about shifts and he talks about the nation shifting. Well, he's exactly right. You see, we read the news and hear the news and we see it from this perspective at the front of the theatre. But actually, there's something very dynamic happening behind the theatre when nations are shifting. God is at work. God is doing things. And when these four great horns were to be broken, the nations were to be broken, and one of the reasons God was breaking them was because they had judged Israel too severely. When they came to take them captive, God said, I used them to punish my people, but they went too far with my people. And he said, because they went too far, God says, I'm going to really punish them. And the way God deals with this world is largely in relation to the Jews. That's how it works in the heavens. It's to do with how they behave with the Jews. And many take the view, and I agree with them, the reason why America is the superpower today is not because of her morality and not because she's a God-fearing nation the way she should be, but because she loves the Jews. That's the reason. God honors the nations that honor his people and always has and always will. Well, the third one, very quickly, is the man with the measuring line. An angel, he sees him going around Jerusalem. And he's traveling around Jerusalem and he's got this line and he's measuring the length and breadth because they're going to build the walls and extend this. This is just rubble and he's going to build it. And there's a lot of things happen there to do with the building. But we're not going into that other than God says to them, this building's going to go up. In other words, God says, this is all about me fulfilling my purpose, my objective, my will. And Zechariah, you have to come into line with what I'm doing. Don't be, don't be been manipulated by what you see around you. Don't be manipulated by the people who are discouraging you. Don't be manipulated by the people who are just interested in building their homes and have no interest in anything. He says, don't let those things distract you. He said, you have to get into alignment with what I'm doing. Hear what I have to say. And then, of course, as the promise of the building comes, we come to the, to the latter part. And that is in chapter 3. Because we move from what we've mentioned and the angelic activity 
and from the promises of God and from God being stirred up. And then there's the practical outworking of what God wants. Of course, as we've said, he has stirred up Zechariah, has told him to shout and to start preaching it, preaching what God is saying, start telling the people what God has to say. It'll be unique, it'll be different, nobody else is saying it. Because God has given it because it's a new era, it's a new time, it's a new message that's needed for the people of that day. And so in very chapter 3 it says, uh, He showed me Joshua the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand. This is another vision. This is very important. You see friends, the high priest speaks of communion. The high priest's jo job it was, was to bring the people to God. It was to bring the grace and the mercy of God upon the people. His job was to seek the Lord and to pray. His, his job was to bless the people. Whenever he had gone in to the holy place, when sacrifices had been made, he would come out and he would raise his hands and he would bless the people with raised hands and bless the people and the nation of Israel. So they could bless, they could commune. He was really the one that we would say he broke through to God. He, he's the one where, where, where the individual gets through to God and where God communes back. That's, that's the job of the high priest. And you and I are priests to God. You and I have the ministry of prayer granted to us where we can come into the presence of God and seek the Lord in prayer, every one of us. We are all priests to God. But I want you to notice that as the high priest in this very important position of communing with God and where blessing would flow and where blessing would be pronounced, I want you to notice who's standing at that very place. Satan. There's not many mentions of Satan directly in the Old Testament, ruling out his origin in Isaiah and, and in, in, uh, in Jeremiah, or Ezekiel rather. We have him in the Garden of Eden, accusing, lying, deceiving. We have him in the book of Job, again accusing, and at the throne over Job, the righteous man. And then we have him here. He's at the place where the high priest is. He's always friends at places of great importance. Great importance. The place where communion with God was broken. In the Garden of Eden, he's there. The place where the most righteous man on the earth was displaced somewhat and left and brought into such dismay and pain and agony. He's there. And the place where the high priest is coming before God for the fulfillment of promises, where promises are essentially either made or not made, where they're fulfilled or not fulfilled, where the angelic host are coming through for Zechariah, trying to help him because God can see that Zechariah, uh, revealed to Zechariah that the high priest at this time in Israel, at this place and juncture in their history, he's in trouble. The high priest is in trouble. Friends, the people of God today are in trouble. We're in trouble in the place of prayer. We're in trouble in communion with God. We're in trouble in breaking through to God. The church is in deep trouble today. I know that you can get churches where there's masses of people. And, and don't get me wrong, that's, that's a wonderful thing when you've loads of people. Uh, well, uh, not qualify that. But anyway, but other, other than to say... There are many people and we can, have, we can have events and we can have courses and we can have another course on top of the course and this course beside that course and everybody's doing every course and, and they're all doing these things and they're all active and they're running helter-skelter here and there and yonder. But the great centrality of communion with God and brokenness and seeking God in prayer with a broken heart is neglected. Is neglected. And that's the place, that's the place where Satan stands. You see, in the history of our church here in Ulster, in the history of our church a generation or two ago, it was not uncommon to find churches where people prayed all night. 
It was not uncommon to find people who came and fasted for the day and prayed for their pastor that there would be souls saved. But you'll not find that today. Oh, you'll find them drinking tea and laughing and, and doing courses and this course and that course and the other course about that course. And they're all talking about the courses I'm on. Now, I'm not against courses. Don't get me wrong. All I'm saying is you can be so active in all this stuff. And yet the very thing that heaven wants to communicate that you desperately need to hear. It's like God's looking on and saying, you are just going round and round and round and heaven has something it wants to do and earth's not even listening because we're busy for the Lord we're busy serving the Lord and the Lord and the angels are standing back and saying please 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 would you would you come to this place where you can hear from me would you lead these people pastors leaders teachers would you bring the people to this place where they can hear from me and where I will speak to them and where I'll commune with them and where I will begin to do things my power will manifest on earth But the high priest had a problem and we have a problem and this was the problem Satan was standing there and Satan said to the Lord he said he's dirty he's dirty he has stains all over his garments he's the high priest his garments should be clean and white linen but they're filthy they're filthy undoubtedly Jeremiah or, or Joshua had problems but he wasn't there just for himself he was there for the sin of the people so it wasn't just his problems it was everybody's problems and Satan looked and Satan said I have you <laughs> you'll never get breakthrough <laughs> it's not gonna happen too many problems here and I'm standing here because I know where to stand it's not gonna happen it's not going to be a rebuilding because I have some ballot and Tobiah and they have been really discouraging Nehemiah I have my people on the ground and I have been doing everything in my power to blind these people and to stupefy them and make sure that they don't make God first and I have told them to build beautiful houses and put new cedar inside them and he said I have been doing all this and I have been doing a great job and and Satan said to God you see you see they don't really love you so I can throw a bit of dirt at Joshua and there's a bit of idolatry still in them the still of the longings back and so their ancestry isn't too good they've, they've been idolaters at heart and I throw another bit of dirt on you and he just takes one after the other and he throws the dirt and poor Joshua isn't making much of it not looking good not looking good and Satan thinks, boy, it's going to fail. It's going to fail. But, but, in verse 2 it says of chapter 3, And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan. Even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem. That's the promise. That's the promise. Here we have the Lord using the promise against Satan here is the Lord using the same promise that he gave to Jeremiah that he had given to the people that he had given to Haggai that he had given to, to uh, Zechariah and God's using it now you see do you remember I said to you when you use the promises of God in prayer you're coming into alignment with what God's doing and saying and so the enemy is first of all rebuked by the word of God and the Lord said to him is not this a brand picked out of the fire Satan do you not understand I know what he has done I know what my people have done I know the terrible things that you're accusing of but I have plucked them they're half burned but I got them out of the fire what God is saying to Satan is I am going to defeat you at the cross. Your legal rights I dismiss because I'm a God of grace. 
and you have no rights. The promise is before me. And then the Bible says that Joshua was clothed. Uh, he had been clothed with filth, filthy garments. And he answered and spake unto those that stood before, which were probably angels. And they said, take away the filthy garments from him. And he said unto, uh, and said unto him, behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee. And I will clothe thee with a change of raiment. And as Satan stands, he's rebuked before the Lord by the promises of God. I say, use the promises of God in prayer. The enemy was rebuked as, as it was pleaded with God. God used it against the enemy and he was pushed back and the angels came forward and they put this beautiful covering upon him. And you see, friends, you could be under so many uh, garments laid on you by the enemy. There could be the awful garment of condemnation. And you feel so condemned and unworthy and failure and so on and so forth. Oh, he's so astute at throwing dirt. He's so astute. But it's all taken away. Now, as I close, I want you to grasp this. The angels came forth when the Lord said, the Lord said, put a new garment on him. And the angels came forth. And they put the new garment on him. This is all to do with ultimately breakthrough and communion. So that's the other side. Understand, we're, we're looking in at the other side. This is one of his visions. He sees the high priest. He sees Satan. He sees the angels clothing him. He sees the Lord rebuking him on the throne. Wonderful what's happening on the other side. But can we have any impact into the other side? Can anything we say or do on earth have any influence into that world? Well, look at the next verse. I said, verse 5, let them set a firm mitre on his head. We Zechariah says, oh, it's wonderful. I mean, it's amazing, this great battle in the heavens going on here regarding breakthrough for the people of God and the building of the temple and, and, and heaven, essentially, I'm watching what's going on in that domain and the angels put these garments on him and then little Zechariah speaks up, what about a new headband for him? What about, what about a mitre with holiness unto the Lord? And immediately it happens. Immediately it happens. As he declares out little insignificant Zechariah what about a mitre and it's done oh you can come into alignment with God you can come into alignment with what God is doing and you suddenly discover that you line up with angels you line up with God you line up with the Holy Spirit and you'll discover things that you may say and things that you may do will be having a profound impact both in this world and in that world. You see, friends, in closing, one of the other pictures that the Lord showed him after that was this, and I close. He said to him, here's another vision. Candlestick, menorah, you know the, the menorah, the seven candlestick for the Jews. Two trees above it. He says, what in the goodness is this? He said, do you not know what it is? <laughs> it's quite funny that. The angel says to him, do you, not, do you not know? Do you know, angels are amazed at us. Angels fully understood what it meant. They, in, their, in their dimension, they understood that these trees were two people and that this was the oil pouring in. They, I mean, in their dimension, that's perfect, perfectly. But whenever he says to Zach, Zachariah, says to him, what is this? And he says, do you not know what it means? They sometimes are a bit confused with us. Sometimes they scratch their head and said, do you not see it? And then he explains it. He says, this is the anointing oil. This is the oil. This is the way it's all going to happen. This is the way God says, I'm going to fulfill it. This is the way the temple's going to be built. And this is the way, ultimately, the new Jerusalem will come. The Messiah will come. Every promise will be fulfilled. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Zechariah, 
That's the way it's always to be done. By my Spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Let me close. One preacher said, man can find God, but never fathom him. That's true. <laughs> One other preacher said, no Christian is truly spiritual who does not revel as much in his ignorance of God as in his knowledge of him. God is great. And only God is great. Let's bow in prayer. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for your word. And we pray, Lord, that you would apply your word to our hearts. And you would enable us, Lord, to come into alignment with what you are doing. We thank you, Lord, that you are great and greatly to be praised. And we thank you for all the wonderful things that you are planning and that you are going to do in the days ahead. So, Lord, help each one of us to be at the place where we're meant to be. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you and thank you for listening.